Hi, I'm Caroline Levitt, and I'm the co-founder of A Mighty Blaze, the book initiative that was started just when the lockdown did. Uh, it's meant to, it was meant to help independent bookstores and to help writers and readers connect. And we're now going on, I think, three years or four years. It's, it means that the Mighty Blaze is now a toddler. Um, today, we have Catherine Vaz and this absolutely gorgeous book, Above the Salts. We're going to be talking about this cover later, and it's, it's just amazingly beautiful inside and out. So let me tell you a little bit about Catherine. Um, Catherine Vaz has been a Briggs Copeland Fellow in Fiction at Harvard University and Fellow of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She's the author of three novels. She was in Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writer Selection. Her novel Mariana was published in Six Languages and picked up by the Library of Congress as one of the top 30 International Books of 1998. Her collection, Fado and Other Stories, won a Drew Hines Literature Prize, and Our Lady of the Artichokes won a Prairie Schooner Award. Her children's stories have appeared in anthologies. She won a New York Film Academy and Writer's Store National Contest for a screenplay Let's play idea based on one of her stories. Catherine's actually the first Portuguese American to have her work recorded by the Library of Congress. Other honors include a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship, a citation as a Portuguese American Woman of the Year, an appointment to the six person presidential delegation to the World's Fair Expo 98 in Lisboa by Clinton. So this is her book, which already is one of People Magazine's best new books to read. It's also praised on Good Morning America, ABC News, and it was picked as one of the top 15 books of November. And I'm sure there's many, many more prizes about it. So I still have more introduction. So Above the Salt is based on the true story of the converts to Presbyterianism on the Portuguese island of Madeira, who were violently driven into the sea. John Elvis grew up in jail with his mother, who was condemned to die for heresy, and later granted a reprieve. And he and another refugee fled this violence only to reignite their budding romance in America during the Civil War. Tyree Jones has said of this book, Catherine Vaz is the real thing an American treasure. Alexander Chi said, the first time I ever heard Catherine Vaz read, I remember thinking, who is this sorceress? As she made me cry in public. Now we have a new novel from her and the magic has expanded. Uh, welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm just so thrilled to have you here and to talk with you about your gorgeous book. So thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Carolyn, for having me on the show and for inventing it, this platform in the first place, because I know you have your own new book coming out very soon in just a few months. And um, yet you've, you've been so supportive of other writers and this is part of how you do that. And so please know how much it's appreciated. And I, I think um, especially doing it to connect people during the pandemic was um, particularly thoughtful. Um, and thank you for reading that Alexander Chi blurb because that's one of my all-time favorites that I made him. I, he also laughed a lot when I did that reading. <laughs> and then he broke down in tears and did, who is this sorceress is really one of my favorite quotes. Um, at my book launch party, it's really only nine days ago, it seems like longer, um, my husband Christopher Cerf said to the assembly, Catherine can't write a sentence without me crying, which is a real victory. He said, <gasps> and now she has a book and it's full of. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Yes. And, and you said you would read, you would, you would read later on in the interview. We would like to read, to read oh, great, um, great, great. a few very, very brief uh, passages that are, can be heard on their own separate from the, from the book, which uh, took me, I've lost count of how many years it took. I say 15, but Christopher said, we've been saying that for two years, so maybe it's 17. <gasps> so it's it has been that long. So I'm a different person from when I started. Um, and, and we always are a different person from when we begin and end a book, but this right. one especially so, I think. But it was my contribution, this was very important to me, 
about a little known immigration story of the Portuguese to America. And it also was, um, they were driven off the island of Madeira during religious conflict, um, you know, the never ending problem of the world, but Illinois adopted them. Jacksonville and Springfield, Illinois took in, per, you know, the, the number is varies, but uh, at least hundreds, possibly up to 2000 immigrants, refugees, exiles who were penniless and desperate. And Illinois took them in and gave them places to live and homes and work. And it was an act of generosity that was tremendous. Uh, Jacksonville still has Madeira Hill. Now, life is complicated. It can also be said that as strong abolitionists, they were a great solid voting block for the Republicans who were, you know, the Abraham Lincoln party. Um, and Illinois was a battlefield of people coming up from the South, um, uh, Democrats coming up from the South, pro-enslavement. And so they were a solid block of strong abolitionists. And they, but it was also generous to have taken them in, given them um, this place to live. And this was based on a true story I stumbled across when I was giving a talk at the Library of Congress. And there was something in the map room called the Portuguese Protestants of Illinois. And my dear friend, Dr. Ieda Shikera Wiarda, who was working in the Hispanic division at the time, said, you must see this. And um, she was born and raised in Brazil and working in the Library of Congress. And so I owe her a debt of gratitude for leading me toward this story, which uh, I had never heard of. So, um, you know, it's a wonderful story about, I hope, about um, this country taking people in need in, and they, they were a thriving community. That's incredible. Can you tell us a little bit about John Alves? Am I pronouncing his last name right? Well, it would be, it, the Americanization would be Alves is probably how they said it. Um, Portuguese tends to be like the continental Portuguese as opposed to Brazilian would be more like Alves, but, but Alves okay. is probably what they were called in America. And um, I do a bit of a pronunciation help early in the book. <laughs> um, do that. But um, he gave a, um, one thing I can tell people is that I gave a slide presentation on my research recently at the Center for Fiction in Brooklyn. And I don't know what the restrictions are, but I think you can watch it on YouTube. Oh, great. If you so desire. Um, and I talk a lot in that presentation about John Alves, who was it, raised in jail with his mother because he was a right. boy in a small village in an island and he was put in jail with her. And I assume it's because he was clinging to her and when she was taken away um, because she was a, a vocal advocate of Presbyterianism. And, um, you know, keep in mind the, the, the minister, the Scottish minister who was converting these people was teaching people to read. And the way you do that, uh, you want women to read as well because they can then read the Bible. So, um, but as an old man, older man, he gave an interview in the, uh, in a Salt Lake City newspaper about uh, falling in love with someone. He had courted the Lincoln household, which is already a remarkable thing. And going off to war as a Union soldier and then coming back and he doesn't say what happened. He is articulate about everything, but this blank year where he came back to Illinois and then he wandered the West for a long time. So to me as a novelist, I thought that blank wow. year is my canvas. And when he was in as an old man revisiting the Lincoln household, there were two people talking about the old days. And he spoke up and he said, no, it wasn't that way. Lincoln didn't heat that fireplace with a stove. Um, he, he, he spoke up. And so a man named John Drinkwater, a visiting playwright from England, said, well, I wrote a play about it and I'd like to know what my other mistakes were. And he took John. <laughs> and um, but when this is the thing that stuck with me and got me through 15 years of writing, when the time came to sign the guest book, 
John was trembling so much to recall Mary that he couldn't sign his name properly. And so I, that got me, that got me and never let go that, that John Drinkwater had to sign the name for him. And when I was doing my research, the women at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Illinois were so excited. There was some there who wanted to do <laughs> research that wasn't about genealogy, that I wasn't like the descended from the third cousin of the person who was a pallbearer for Lincoln. They were so excited. They kept getting stuff out of the vault for me. And I said, could we see the, the what was called the Lincoln Ledger, the guest book? And it was verbatim the way he described it as an old man. And so that kind of honesty also um, got to me too. But that was my canvas, that blank year. And I wrote hundreds of pages in it and took hundreds out trying to get the story right. And you know what that's like. That, that kind of It's like Dante's circle of hell. <laughs> Yeah, the, the circle of ice where I got stuck and just the heads are showing, you know, that. Right, right. <laughs> um, I got stuck on the ice a long time, which was appropriate. I, you know, during my talk, I said they went from Madeira, which was subtropical, brightly colored, very precipitous in the landscape to Illinois, which is flat <gasps> and snowy. And, and how did that feel to them? So I think research, I'm a big believer is get up and away from your computer, go Go out there and let the world surprise you. Let the things come to you. Um, I think it was James Joyce, I'm pretty sure, who said, when you're in the flow and open to what the world gives you, just stand on a street corner and the word you're seeking will blow up on a piece of paper and land at your feet. So I had lots of things like that happen that were quite- Like what? Like what? Tell us some of them. Well, um, a little one was I was in something called the Lincoln Library, which was a different place. And I saw a nameplate that said Stephen Govea. And I went up to him and I said, by any chance, I recognize that last name is Portuguese. By any chance, are you descended from the people who came as penniless refugees to Madeira Hill? And he said, oh my God, no one's ever said that to me before. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. And so, and he introduced me to a lot of people in the community. Um, another quite wonderful example is that a teaching fellowship emerged at Illinois College in Jacksonville. What are the odds of that? Because Illinois College in Jacksonville was an institution um, of higher learning, a liberal arts college started by abolitionists. In fact, the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe was the first president. And Jacksonville was in a battle for the spirit of, and soul of this country, it's a battle we're still fighting, which was Jacksonville wanted to be an experiment of community-based living, institutions for women of, of higher wow. level. Jacksonville Female Academy, which was comically referred to as the, I think, Jacksonville or the jail for angels, jail for angels. Um, and, one of the biggest institutions and places of innovation for the deaf in the country, a institutions for the blind, the indigent um, people in need and people who had made money. And there were a lot of them who did with cattle, uh, speculation, what have you, real estate. They believed in putting that money into creating a community that took care of one another. Um, <sighs> So that's a sub theme in my book that in contrast, and this is a generality because of course Springfield was not exclusively this, but Springfield was where the individual came, tried to make a fortune, moved on if that didn't work out. Uh, the railroads went through Springfield commerce. Um, they left behind a lot of what were called gold widows, which were men would just think, well, I'm gonna go I say this as a Californian, it was the era of the gold rush. So I'm gonna go west and make my fortune, bye bye hon. And they would start new families and that would be that. So um, I found that there was a battle for, are we a country of community or individualism? And that's still an issue for us. Oh but, yeah. But Jacksonville and Springfield, Illinois, we're trying that on for size. So I came across that as a researcher, but let me let me backtrack slightly, and then I'll I'll have you ask another question. No, you can talk. <laughs> exciting, exciting. And while I was at Illinois College as a guest, 
teacher. I came, I met um, a botanist named Dr. Lawrence Zettler, who was inventing ghost orchid perfume. And I thought, I've never heard of such a thing. And yeah. I knew that there were ghost, something called ghost orchids or any kind of orchid on the prairie in Illinois. I would never have guessed that or known that. He took me on foraging expeditions and he found some. And last May in London, he gave me a vial of finished ghost orchid perfume. Well, <gasps> that makes a cameo in my book because I couldn't resist. And I happened to be there during the 13 year hatching of cicadas. And I thought I was in a horror movie. I, oh. thought it was horror movie. I had never seen something like this before. And he thought it was amusing that I had no idea. What were movie. you outside when this yeah. happened? Or were you, oh God. And I was like, what is going on? It was like a horror movie. And <laughs> said, oh yeah, you know, people would, there was so thick that horses would break their legs and slip. Oh. And um, so that makes a cameo in the book too. That is not something I would have known to look up on my computer. I had to be there, right. recept receptors open, not just to facts, but to a person who, who told me about this. It's very, it's really, really important to talk to real people during research because exactly. you're looking for stories. You're not just looking for the facts. It's the yeah. stories that come out of people that are so interesting. I, I really want to ask you about the years you took to complete this project and how you managed to persevere. Did you work on other projects while you were doing this? Was there ever a moment where you felt, I'm giving up? And yep. was, there ever, <laughs> was there ever a moment when you felt, now well, I'm done, now I'm done? Girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, everything, yes, 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 yes. Because there were many times, there was one year when I put it aside. After my father died, I just, even though I, he was enthusiastic about it and I fueled, I, I fueled his love and his wish for completion into finishing. But there was a year where I didn't work on it. So I don't know if that counts in my 16 years or 18 or whatever it is now. Um, and and I talked about this at the Center for Fiction because that was a big question. How do you keep going? Because as we all know from childhood, the world does not necessarily reward right. perseverance on something you should more properly give up. And you can spend years on something. And sometimes it is better to say, stop. I This is not tracking right. But I think... Something kept me going in, in, a, in an intellectual way. The Radcliffe Institute gave me a fellowship based on it. So I thought they saw something there. I can find it too. Um, my strength as a writer, as happens for many writers, is I can, I can write about a tree for five pages. And every now and then you have to hone that back let the characters, their actions, let the emotions be displayed through uh, characters backed into a corner. All the things I know from whether teaching or my own writing, but I did have help from editors. I want to talk about that. Yes. Um, I, uh, I did a lot of it on my own, knowing the rules and doing my best to bring the characters to the fore, torquing them to the surface. And that main line going from beginning to end, which you do, you know, exceptionally well in your books. And it's like, what do the characters do? What's next? What happens to them? Right. And, and the tangents here, they could be interesting. They could be well-written, but stand back and look at the whole canvas and look at the whole, you know, the forest for the trees thing. So when I found my marvelous agent Ellen Levine at Trident Media. She said, I love your writing. I love this book, but I do want you to work with this freelance fellow I know named um, Randall Klein, who's, and he was brilliant with keeping that forward momentum created and strong and you helping me with momentum while preserving, you know, the strengths of lyrical writing. Um, I worked with a woman um, before that, in Los Angeles, named Leslie Lair, who I know Leslie. Yeah, she worked with me too, and she came up with let's you know how about this happening and this happening and this happening, and that was 
that really set my mind into get out of the rhythm or the musicality and into um, the excitement of story. Uh, yes, and so Leslie and Randall, and then Ellen sold the book to Megan Lynch at Flatiron Books, an imprint of Macmillan. And Megan said, I love your book. It's, you know, it's wonderful, but now we're going to work for a year. We, I want to for a year. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and she said, I want your, your Mary and John to be um, leading the story even more. And she said, and, and uh, these were all generous, smart, talented mm -hmm. people who gave their expertise to helping me through the forest and, and at one point, I think Megan also said that the the character of Edward is, was she wanted a little more work with him, and it was very important for me to get Edward right because I wanted two really decent, different but decent men to be in this love triangle. I think it's much harder to have three good people trying to figure out what to do instead of one. It's like just. I know the times were different, Mary, but just leave him if he's terrible. And so I had a huge amount of help and it was with this kind of wonderful mutual respect and perseverance. But I think if you're talking about the years before I got it to Ellen and then Megan, and um, I would step back and knowing, okay, Where's the story? What's the story? And doing my best, getting it as clean and sharp as I could make it before I went out was something that took me a very long time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're just too deeply in the story too, aren't you? You can't see. I mean, I've been surprised by editorial comments where I feel like, why didn't I see that? Why didn't I see that? <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, there was one, for example, um, you know, a fellow who who's a sub agent working with with um, Ellen named Rich Green, who had read it. And he said, you know, when Mary, uh, in an earlier draft, I have John's mother run off to see him during the war to ask his forgiveness for not being more tolerant of him being in love with someone of a different religion. And I have him, the mother go and finding him. And then, should I give this away? This is, I'm terrible at this. I'm doing this. Um, but it's then okay. Mary, then Mary does. And he said, don't take it away from Mary being the one to do that. So I thought, you're right. I don't yeah, know. you give her the agency. Of course. Um, so I changed that. She, the mother does set out to see him. And sometimes you do this to with characters, as you know, and this is fun. I thought, all right, Serafina, you had a very dramatic opening few chapters of the book but I'm not sure what you were up to at the moment. You seem to just be lying down at home and I don't, so I'm, you need to get up and go out. And so <laughs> she basically thought, all right, I'm going to get up and go out. And she did. And it was one of the most fun parts to write of the book because she develops a friendship with a woman that, that is at the later part of her life, but that I thought made her life more redemptive and brought it back to, and I didn't know she had to kind of lead the way with that. And that, of course, is the fun part when you tell a character, you tell me because I'm I'm exhausted. And, yeah. And sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. You have like two great comments here. We have from Randy says, I love books with the world salt in the title. I'm fascinated by assault overall. What inspired the choice of this title? Well, the title was, um, I think, I, I'm glad it works. And the the cover, I can't say enough about the work of a fellow named Rex Bonomelli, who did this gorgeous cover for me. They flat iron said, what are your ideas for a cover? And, and I just said, please, I, someone talented surprising me is what I want. But I tend to like bright colors, non-representational things. And, and, and that's all I said. So salt, it is... I think taste is a sensory thing. The book, I hope, is full of sensory impressions and sensory feel, because it's a very a book about bodies as well as hearts and minds. And salt, of course, is tears. Salt, of course, is the ocean. There is a line by the 
this is an anachronism, but there is a line by the modernist poet Fernando Pessoa that basically said the ocean is, I'm paraphrasing, the ocean is full of salt because of all the tears Portuguese people have shed on its beaches, on their beaches. And so it's ocean, it's tears, it's rising above, it's um, sweat, but it's also a very technical expression. I think Victorians used it as well. Um, should I keep it a surprise? It's in the book, it's in the Lincoln scene where these two people meet and court at the Lincoln household. But it's a designation where salt shakers are in the middle of a table usually. And if you're invited above the salt, it means that a homeowner, someone of probably prestige has invited you to the status of being above the salt. And for two immigrants who were penniless when they came to America, to be invited above the salt by Abraham Lincoln was is a significance. But there's I've noticed that there are a lot salt is used in a lot of titles, but that's I like I like it. There's also sowing salt is is of course an expression about war and um, crying, but also sweat and love and tears and, and all the rest. Okay, we have another comment and I want you to read. This okay. is from Serious yeah. Thinking, uh, it, which is Chris, I bet. If you're going to read complete sentences, Catherine, I'd better get a few boxes of tissues ready. Yes, Catherine, that is would, so, you, that is so. yeah. <laughs> would you would you please read more than a few complete sentences for us? Because sure. I, I, it's just such beautiful language. All right, I'm happy to do that. This okay, is great. A, a brief passage about my protagonist, Mary, who lost both her parents, um, or rather, I lost both my parents over the course of writing this book. So my father would wish us pink dreams when we were children, which is the Portuguese way of wishing children um, the equivalent is sweet dreams. Well, this is what my protagonist, Mary, recalls about her father. Sometimes Mary feels as breakable as a teacup or a fragile plate that is kept in a cupboard after all the other plates in the set got broken long ago. Her father vows to protect her and he tucks her into her feather bed while wishing her pink dreams, the Lusitanian way of granting sweet dreams, night rest in the shade of peonies, the raptures of sunrise, the tint of the camellias that got the best of God's paintbrush. Sail into pink and seize it as yours, my living angel, my own dream incarnate. And then I can read a few lines, like five lines. Please do. When Mary and her father leave New York for the Midwest, because it's an image that captures my own personal reference points, which are California and New York, where I now live. When the steamship's wake sent out froth, Mary's heart erupted with frazzle cracks from an abiding worship of New York. And farther west, onward, there was gold, gold pried out of crevices. She had heard Illinois was very cold and extremely flat. Perhaps the winds there were like curtains that blew all the way to California and dipped into the Pacific where the gold had run off in rivulets. And then the curtains made of wind blew back to the center of the country, brushing gold upon everyone's head. That's so dazzling. I want to ask you before you read any more, um, does the language come first before the story? And do you read your work out loud to see how the language sounds or do you just hear it in your head? I hear it in my head. Um, in fact, the last passage of the, passage of the book is one that just got dumped entirely into my head while I was shopping at Gourmet Garage. Which <laughs> I this movie, which came, well, it's the only part of the book that's probably not been changed. It just came there and I went home and just tilt, tipped my head and wrote it out and stayed that way from beginning to end. So um, that's the only part that that happens. In that's incredible. So I let that happen because it's fun. And I hear, I hear the story before I know it. But I also think then I need to, you know, the craft party for your brain. All right, fine. But where's the story? Come back to having this be in the service of my characters and, and what they're doing and what happens to them. And so revision. 
I, I don't like to stem that other thing, but I also know it requires shaping another or it becomes self-indulgent. Right. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I also want to know how and why or if your writing has changed through the years. Do you feel that once you finish a book, okay, I really learned how to do, say, dual timelines in this book, and I can apply those lessons to the next book? Or do you feel, okay, I learned these lessons, and this is a brand new book, and nothing I've learned before is applicable to this new book? Absolutely. <laughs> I was afraid of that. I got worked for this book, and now I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just every book has a fresh. I think it's a, I think it's a little dangerous to feel like you've learned everything you need to know. And each book has its own finds its shape and 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 feeling. And I think that there were so many times where I just had to stop and say, now think of story, um, and. Um, now listen to your characters right. and now and now vary the music by writing just a plain she walked into a room type sentences um ground yourself so that there's texture in in the language and it's just not all a you know a ballad so i think that that's something i also try to do could you read one more short yeah. paragraph for us I, I sure could um this is john who is in the New York Harbor with his mother. And they are waiting to be adopted by the people of Illinois. So he's in a reverie about um, what's happening in Illinois before they go there. They are impoverished and they're waiting in New York for cholera to lift so they can go to their new homes. John could almost hear the citizens far away in Illinois scurrying around to receive them. Huts with dents hammered out and cloth wearing what looks like a mist of itself lifting off, a kind of cloth meant for Midwestern weather, all hurtle into the mass of goods being assembled. The women of Jackson Villa and Springfield are in a flurry, preparing for the newcomers, collecting lamps that use whale oil. And so the smoke, the vapor of the dead out of the sea, fills the nostrils in the prairie with Leviathan fantasies. Jars of pumpkin chips swimming in syrup and tongues in aspic, such unheard of things emerging from cupboards for the Portuguese Protestants, along with hats that are thick. Americans wear a nearness to the size of cats on their heads. How does invention follow dream and how does it come to belong to others? The spirits of the whales shall rise nonstop out of lamps like the genie in the story about wishes that John's sister once read to him. The flames going strong because Americans demand must now have light beyond the Lord's daylight. Women with the heat of stoves biting their faces are speeding to receive the exiles. Here, praising God is action. Here, praising God is about putting everything to use. But first, dusk bays New York, where John sits with his mother as the gulls trill so as to make him clutch her as if that would cure all that besieged her. And their song was, Twilight is a paint spill, all jeweled, and here you are, and here you are born. That's just breathtaking. And just, just an addendum to that, what inspired that passage was when I ordered the Veterans Administration Administration's papers about John Alves, he put New York as his birthplace. Wow. So I thought, what a tribute to the place where he started out as an American, you know, where he was a, at first a refugee. I wanted to ask you, um, you're part of a creative co couple with Christopher Scherf, who not only contributed music to Sesame Street, but right. so many other programs and stuff. I, you know, I, I'm part of a creative couple, too, and I find that after many, many terrible relationships with somebody who is not creative, yes. that it's very important to have somebody who gets what you're doing. So yes. can you talk a little bit about your partnership? And um, Sure. I mean, you're just wonderful together. Yeah. I mean, he's the love of my life, and people, young, old, come up and say, how did you do it? You're so sweet and wonderful together. I said, well, don't wait as long as I did, but I think I... <laughs> You know, I gave up and I thought I'll know it when it's when it's right. Christopher comes from 
a publishing family. His dad, Bennett Cerf, started Random House. And sometimes people remember him from the show, What's My Line? And the joy that man had with his authors. Um, and Chris was an editor for a while. And then, of course, was on the original crazy band of people who worked on Sesame Street. He was also on the National Lampoon. And what makes our relationship work is something that is a line from Rilke, which is being guardians of each other's solitude. So that, yes. is, that is the thing to, to keep in mind and that we we live by, and that makes us very happy. You know, there's, there's you hear the expression that uh, relationships are a lot of work and you have to work at marriage. Or to, and I get what that means. And I, I think that's an important philosophy to have, but, I secretly think that um, when it's right, it's it's, it's right. Easy. It's easy. It's not work. It's fun. I mean, maybe it just, I think at one point, especially maybe for women, um, it's like, you don't try and people are fully baked at a certain age. They're just who they are. And you, that's the call to love is accepting that. I think. I think also, and I bet you'd agree that, you know, I didn't marry my husband until I was in my 40s. And yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect because I had gone through all these crazy other relationships. Oh, yeah. I had been wild and I was ready to say, okay, I know what's important and what I well, want. You, you know, it's a place of safety and that it's good because you look back. I look back on the kind of the swamplands of my past and I think, why <laughs> in the world? Why in the world did I spend so much time? straining over and moping about things that wouldn't wouldn't work and didn't work and I you can't get people to love you if they don't and it's right. you know but I think when you're younger I just also want to appreciate that when you're younger that's you know you it, it's it's more difficult to to believe that that one day it can be easy I think right right was yeah. for me and isn't silliness also a big part of your life? <laughs> yeah. I mean, where where we love our, you know, how couples have what I think of as the language of twins. Yes. Language. I mean, he'll start talking about the New York Rangers hockey team and I automatically start snoring. So he will do that and I'll snore loudly. <laughs> so, um, so we have we have fun together and he's just been wonderful with my book coming out and it it covers the span of our relationship it's interesting I wrote this major love story from a place of security with my own I think I always ask you I actually ask all writers this question because it really says something about me rather than the other writers what's obsessing you now and why oh you know um I think that what I've given myself is permission to enjoy talking with and communicating with readers. And at my book launch party recently, my uh, friend, Bridgette Davis, who is herself a wonderful novelist and a, she's also a filmmaker, she said to me, take some time now to communicate with readers and be with them. And, and then she grinned and said, and take your vitamins. And, <laughs> and I thought, yes. For a little while, I'm going to enjoy the love of all that. I mean, readers have reached out to me, and my biggest, like, oh my gosh, I did it. Feeling is the writer, the readers who are not related to me or or friends who have written and say the plot is so wonderful and and full of unexpected twists and turns, and it moves really well plotted and they and I thought, oh my gosh, I worked so hard at that. That's so gratifying. But the secret obsession now is, um, as what happens, what's next for me? What do I want to sink in? I'm trying my first screenplay. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Of, of something you've written already? Um, it is. It's an adaptation of my sh short story, Our Lady of the Artichokes. Great. And I've been working with... Um, a, a screenwriter producer herself, a uh, wonderful named Robin Swicord, and was in one of her workshops. And she's given me a lot of guidance. So kind of a different gear with that. And and image and plot are, you know, I'm trying to training myself to use that writing form to learn something new. 
and do something new. But I want to do a short novel. And it was a very funny moment. I went out to dinner with Ellen Levine. I said, my next novel is going to be short. And she looked at me, she grinned, and she said, what's short to you? She said, the next is <laughs> And I cut, out, I cut out 100 pages before I was done. Wow. Yeah. And wow. I said, no, 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 Ellen, about 150 pages. I really want to do something that feels like a short contemporary thing. But that might be because I did a long historical book. Um, and that's my reaction. So, but but trying to do a different form, a different shape. Like I mm -hmm. feel like a sculptor who did this big thing and now I want to do something smaller. So I want to show this gorgeous cover again and tell everybody, I put the link right in the chat for everybody to make it really easy for you to go and buy it, but you can also buy it from your favorite independent bookstore. And I want to thank everyone for being here. I especially want to thank Catherine Vaz for being here and for writing this gorgeous, gorgeous book. And we'll see you all next time. And Catherine, you just stay on for a moment. I, I tell and thank you, Carolyn, and shout out about that Lisbon shirt you're wearing. Oh, right. That's right. This is this is this was my shirt when we I went to Lisbon. Lisbon. It was the most fabulous trip. I love Portugal. Okay. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.